Hey listeners, it's finally time for 2018 to draw to a close and there are a lot of people out there that think that it couldn't have happened soon enough. One of the things that we are going to think about when we look back at 2018 and the events that happened in the year is that it was incredibly long. There are people out there that have made mistakes of saying that things that happened yet this year happened three years ago. That's how fast our news cycle traveled this year and how much news we tried to cram into a year and news commentary that we tried to cram in about it. But of course we have to take some time here at the end of the year and look back at many of the key events of 2018 and look at how they shaped us throughout the year and how we think that they're going to shape us in 2019 and the events that will follow. Even though if 2018 showed us anything, it is the fact that we never know what's going to come next and we think that certain events are going to shape things and force things to go a certain way and then life has a devious way of surprising us as we go along. 2018 started in a kind of slow note, but there was still plenty of controversy that was going on in January. We started immediately with the State of the Union address, which came under fire based on the fact that the president had members of the families of people who were killed by illegal aliens present during the State of the Union speech. And we also look back at the fact that Nancy Pelosi just sat there grinding her teeth, whether fake or real, throughout the entire speech. And that was the big controversy that went on. Most people thought that the president's speech was inaccurate, most people thought it was overblown, and they thought it was a big publicity stunt, the fact that he had these people from these families in the audience. We also look back at the fact that in January, which was not really that long ago when you look at it, California was threatening to secede from the Union, and there was also a resolution that was traveling through California about how to split it up into two or three or possibly six different states so that representatives and senators and state representatives and governors could service the people more efficiently than they currently could. We never got closure out of that out of the mainstream media, but anybody who went back and researched that a little bit harder found that that resolution died in California state legislature before it could ever be presented to our Congress. In January, I planned to start doing this channel, and indeed, that was going to be my first video, was talking about the split of California. I thought that it was perfect because when I came back from my hiatus on my blog, the first thing I talked about was the resolution in California to secede from the Union, and I thought it would be very poetic to start my channel on a video about California splitting off. Little did I know that something was going to happen this year that was going to shape my channel and the way that I communicate with people, shape my views on the world and the nation at large, and really change the way that our entire country looked at the news, and especially gun control. It was something I felt indeed necessary to start my channel on, even though I had an idea and a script ready for a completely different topic. On February 14th, a student who had been bullied from the time that he joined the school up until the time that he dropped out of the school and beyond took an AR-15 with several small clips back into the school and started shooting up the school. This student, of course, was Nicholas Cruz, and this launched us into an argument as to what we would do with guns in this country, and launched a few people who really didn't deserve fame into fame and mainstream attention in this country in a way that we never thought possible, and indeed we never thought we would hear the end of. This topic is still very interesting to me because we still don't know what happened, and it's been a year. But it also interests me based on the fact that there are a lot of people that forgot that this even happened this year. A couple of weeks ago, when David Hogg announced that he was getting into Harvard for the spring semester, every conservative pundit had to take some time and talk about it. And indeed, that came also with a commentary from Styx Hexenhammer 666. I found this interesting because Styx referred to David Hogg as being 20. And I could see, given the amount of news that's happened between here and Valentine's Day, where somebody could make that mistake and think that this all happened so much longer ago than it actually did. 
David Hogg is 18 years old, or at least if we believe the other news stories that went around this, we would assume that he is 18 at this point, because otherwise he would have been graduating at age 19 from school, and he had a pretty good academic record if he is getting into Harvard, even if it is with a very low SAT score. The reason I believe that David Hogg is 18 now is the fact that when Owen Benjamin was kicked off of Twitter, which also happened this year, it was because he referred to David Hogg as not having pubes and therefore not having a voice in gun control, and Twitter thought this was bad because Hogg was 17 at the time. But in all honesty, without David Hogg saying that he was going to Harvard, because most everybody else has fallen off the radar of this, I think a lot of us would have forgotten about the Parkland shooting by this point. Yes, it was horrible and hellacious, and I think the victims of the shooting need to have some remembrance given to them. However, there has been so much news that I think that would have slipped beyond people's memories if it hadn't been for the fact that CNN continues to prop up David Hogg and keep giving him a spotlight. Culturally, one of the most important events of 2018 was the rise and the fall of the conservative support for Kanye West. Now, given the fact that Kanye West did take some time and decide that he wanted to think for himself rather than being led to think a certain way by a certain political party, and honestly did try to change the thinking of young black men and women across this country, for at least a brief period of time, I do still support Kanye West. I think the self-thought still exists in him, and I do want to reach out and give him the support that he needs. I don't want to completely shove him into the corner based on the fact that he no longer follows along with my ideals anymore, or at least doesn't do so outrightly and vocally. But in all honesty, I think that he has every reason to walk away from the movement that started based on the statements that he made, and I think he is right to feel like he was used in that situation by Candace Owens and Turning Point USA. In reality, Kanye's message was simple, to think for yourself and not think, act, or vote a certain way based on the color of your skin. And Candace Owens really turned that around into, don't think for yourself, continue to have the group think and the easily swayed opinions, but do it in the other direction. I wish Kanye West Godspeed in his next journey. I hope that he continues to think for himself, and I do think that it's a great thing that he was given the opportunity to walk into a Republican White House and talk to the President of the United States. Not many people in his position would be willing to take that opportunity or even have that opportunity in today's polarized society. So good for Kanye. This past year saw a fundamental change in two documents that really structured foreign relations around the country. Back in May, our president decided that he was going to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Now, he didn't tear it up. It's actually still in place. It's just that the U.S. is no longer involved in the nuclear deal and is free to put sanctions back on Iran if they do try to develop a nuclear weapon. All of Europe is still free to involve themselves in the nuclear deal at this point, and we never really got closure on this story, but for the most part it seems that Europe has decided to stay in the nuclear deal. And of course we can't forget about the fact that the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement was completely restructured in a way that would benefit all three countries after months of threatening to completely eliminate the free trade agreement and slap tariffs on both of our closest neighbors. The year past saw a lot of challenges to the First Amendment, and it forced us to have a conversation as to what is freedom of speech and freedom of association, and what actions are blocking the freedom of speech and freedom of association when it applies. I don't think we've even come close to coming to a consensus as to which fact is which, but it is a discussion that I predict that we are going to continue to have into 2019. But we did see various groups around the country calling for the disassociation, and in some cases the firing of various people on both sides of the aisle, whether it be Roseanne, or whether it be Tim Allen, or whether it be Colin Kaepernick, or Samantha B. And we saw several people get thrown out of restaurants just 
basically based on their political viewpoints. And indeed, we saw a partial end, even though the stories opened back up, to the Colorado Cake Baker case that will probably not end anytime soon. Groups around the country have called for disassociation of employers and customers and just about everybody else from some of these people considering them to be social pariahs. And then there are other groups out there that have called to saint every one of the people that I mentioned. All of this, of course, culminated on the Patreon purge of Sargon of Akkad and all of the aftermath that has followed that we can't even begin to talk about on Patreon because while there's already been a lot of talk about it and a lot of people have left the platform both willingly and forcefully, we still don't know what's going to happen from this or how it's going to affect the society at large because for the most part most people haven't had their first pay statement from patreon since all of that happened one of the things that we saw a lot in 2018 was a call for legislation by democrats in order to push a further socialist and left-wing agenda even though Democrats were out of power in every major branch of the government at the time. We saw proposals like Postal Banking and the Accountable Capitalism Act, as well as massive spending packages and opposition to tax cuts and calls for the fact that we're going to raise taxes as soon as we possibly can in this country, all coming out of a party that is completely out of power at this time and will be until the end of next month. With all of these proposals in mind, this is something that we are going to have to watch very closely coming into 2019, especially given the fact that the House of Representatives is about to change from Republican to Democrat. And we are going to see a lot of these bills pass through the House and go over to the Senate, where we will see a lot of pressure on the Senate to act even though the Democrats are out of power over there. In addition to the First Amendment violations that I talked about earlier, we also saw great violations to the Fourth and Fifth Amendments as we went through obviously the Mueller case that is ongoing and will probably be ongoing on until Trump is finally out of office, whether it be 2020 or 2024, and especially when we went along with the Kavanaugh case. In both cases, opponents of both officials want to see them executed publicly without any sort of due process or investigation. They want to just lay out the crimes and assume that all of America will get behind them and support the public execution of both officials. In the Kavanaugh case, the Constitution prevailed and we saw a person who was given his opportunity to have a due process given. He went through the procedure as normal and was confirmed to the Supreme Court, and now it will be upon Democrats in Congress to impeach him and give him a trial and due process in order to remove him if they see fit. With the Parkland shooting being only 10 months ago, we've also seen numerous calls for massive gun control and gun confiscation. All of that boiling down to a congressional representative running his mouth on Twitter and a massive controversy surrounding that as the congressman made a very lewd joke about nuking people to whom he was opposed. With so much attention being put on the 1st, 2nd, 4th, and 5th amendments throughout the past year, I did joke on numerous occasions that if this continues going in the path that it's going, we're going to have to start having a fight about quartering soldiers in our homes during peacetime. But in reality, it is something that we do need to watch because our fundamental rights as American citizens and as humans in general have been under attack for a very long time from our overreaching federal government. And this year has really taken the veil off of a lot of it. Illegal immigration has been at the forefront of the entirety of 2018. Whether it be with DACA or border security or a caravan that came up from Honduras and tried to enter the country without going through a port of entry and get asylum in the correct fashion, that's something we've been talking about extensively throughout the course of 2018. 
whether it's on security itself or what to do about the people that are already here, this has been a polarizing thing in our country throughout the past year and throughout years past beyond that. And it is something that we are going to have to address in a new Congress and hope that we can get something done. Our government is currently shut down based on immigration laws and the immigration argument on security at the border. But nobody seems to be willing to concede or make any sort of compromise on this issue. Before I end on something positive, I want to point one thing out that happened throughout the course of the year that I had hoped would end after Obama was out of office, but instead our media has doubled down on in a great fashion now that Trump is in office. We saw many of these stories out there that we never seemed to get any closure from. Kaepernick just kind of disappeared out of the news. We suddenly stopped talking about the Parkland shooting. We completely ignored any other shooting that happened throughout the year, except for at the moment that it was happening. And of course, the pipe bomber and the synagogue shooter fell out of the news faster than we could even stop to think about what was going on. There's been a big thing that started happening in the Obama administration and that is the fact that we don't get any closure to news stories because we're already on to the next thing so very quickly. The only news story we really got closure from this past year was the Brett Kavanaugh story. And I think a large was because we saw it close on live TV as it was happening. Had our news networks known beyond any sort of doubt that Kavanaugh was going to be confirmed, I feel like this story would have disappeared out of the news just as fast as any of the rest of them that I mentioned. It was very interesting for me to find out the fact that Nicholas Cruz was registered to vote and indeed voted from his jail cell because he was still eligible to vote because he was not convicted. Nicholas Cruz, a confessed killer, was not through trial yet and was still eligible to vote because he was not a convicted felon. A confessed murderer is still awaiting pretrial right now. And nobody knows what happened to the pipe bomber. There are a lot of people out there that still believe, even though they don't talk about it anymore, that he wasn't even the bomber. He wasn't even the person that was sending off all of these bombs. And who can even remember the synagogue shooter's name anymore? These stories continue to happen, and our mainstream media continues to ignore the endings of them, usually because the endings don't fit their political agenda or their political bent. But since we're talking about the mainstream media, I think it's important to talk about one of the best things that came out of 2018, even though a lot of it did start in 2017 and even before that. And that is the rise of a lot of new media voices and the fact that a lot of them are starting to get mainstreamed or at least move into a position where they can be taken seriously as journalists, whether opinion or otherwise. In 2018, new media started exploding. I hear a lot of people talk about how many subscribers they got in the year 2018 and how many of them exceeded their goals and their plans for the year. And indeed, a couple of new voices have cropped up based on the fact that these other new media voices have become successful and they are starting to show us all that it is okay to go out and talk about what's going on in the news without having Fox or Jeremy Boring or any other big media parent company backing us in order to do so. Ben Shapiro has officially moved on to being mainstream, and while I have my opinions on that, it does show a mark of success based on the fact that he can move out and become a mainstream voice from directly in the independent media. Ali Stuckey has done the same thing. Many of the people that I listen to and watch have been able to transfer from having this as being a hobby into making a career out of commenting on the news. And of course, people like me and shows like The Generational Gap have started this past year based on the fact that new media is becoming a big deal as the old media continues to die. And of course, while many of the old media resources are being used right now to try and silence the new media that's coming on, 
We have enough of a fan base, some of us larger than others, that will continue to support us, continue to watch our work, and continue to make sure that we are okay and able to continue our work no matter what happens to us from the old guard media. With all of these stories that we talked about today, we do have to keep in mind the fact that that's not even barely scratching the surface of everything that happened in 2018. There were so many other stories that I couldn't even get to on my channel, and especially in a small video like this. And there are going to be other people that saw more important stories throughout the year that I recommend you go out and find as well. We had a very long year behind us already that was incredibly busy, and I'm sure that 2019 is going to be just as long, if not longer, and is of course going to be just as busy. We're going to see a political gridlock coming out of D.C. We're going to see a lot of changes moving around at the state level. And we don't even know what else is going to crop up out of nowhere, show up in the news, and get immediately forgotten about as we go through the next coming year. So I want to take some time right now and thank everybody for their support, for watching this show, for building me up from one subscriber all the way up to about 90 and for building me up from 70 Twitter followers up into the 400s range and beyond right now on Twitter. I'm very grateful for the opportunity that we have to sit down and talk twice a week about current events that are going on in the country, and I do hope that I inspire you to go out and find more news stories as well and get to the actual root of the facts of the story and not all of the opinions that are surrounding it. And with that, I remind you to never take the words of bloggers, podcasters, or journalists as gospel, and to indeed go out and find all the facts and draw your own conclusions. I wish you and our country the best in 2019, and as always, take care. You're